we talk together again about our... I always feel like it's together, because I can feel you thinking, you see, and you can hear me talking. <laughs> about the prayer of faith, and about the use of the creative imagination. And I began by saying that, first of all, we come to Jesus. And yet, here we are. And you know as well as I do, that even though we try the prayer of faith, and even though we endeavor to teach ourselves to think faithfully, and with hope, and with love, and with courage, still there are times when Jesus himself, instead of becoming nearer to us all the time, seems to become more dim. Now, why? And what else can we do about this? I think the very fact of endeavoring to think faithfully, the very fact sometimes of trying so hard to pray with real power, if we don't watch it, while it's good, and I teach it all the time, and I do it all the time, still in itself it is not enough. Because if we don't be careful, what can happen is we place too much emphasis upon the thinking of our own mind. And we forget that the only value of us learning to think with faith is because as we think with faith, then we open a door in our minds to the real worker of all these miracles upon the earth, Jesus Christ himself. And so we need from time to time to come back to him, forgetting all our faithful thinking, just coming back to him like little children to begin over again at the beginning. And there is another thing too, and this is the main subject of my talk tonight, and that is, we are not only the present living person, you look in the glass and you see yourself, Yes, but you are not only that person whom you see in the looking glass. You are also the little girl who lived 20 years ago or 40 years ago. You are also the little boy who lived 50 years ago or 20 years ago or 70 years ago. And that little one is still living in you. Or in other words, you are not only the conscious personality, you are also the unconscious personality. Or, in other words, again, you need healing not only for the person that you are at the present time, but also for the memories of the past. And you know, all of us need this. Now, I'm moved to do something tonight that I, I don't often do. I don't really like it too much. But I feel that I'm here among friends, and some of you have known my history for a long time. And so I feel like testifying. I feel like telling you a recent and rather personal experience of my own. In order to illustrate, in a rather sledgehammer fashion, I think, that's just what I mean. You know, many people think of me as sort of the great white mother and whatnot. Well, they're very wrong. I'm just an ordinary person like anybody else. <laughs> the only thing is maybe that I try pretty hard and work pretty hard and have worked pretty hard over the years and perhaps have forced myself too far in trying all the time to listen to other people and fill my whole being with the spirits and the psyches of other people. I have a son who's great on dreams. Some of you may have met him, my son Jack and John Sanford. I told him a dream one time, but I didn't need him to interpret it nor do you. I dreamed I was a hotel owner, and I went down to take a, sw uh, a swim in my own swimming pool that belonged to me in my French guard. <laughs> I couldn't even get in it. It was entirely filled with other people. <laughs> so you can see what the subconscious was trying to tell me, that there was not even room for me to get into my own soul. It was entirely filled with the problems and troubles of other people, and so my own soul went rather hungry and became rather starved. He that cometh to me, Jesus said, shall hunger no more. He that believeth on me shall thirst no more. And yet I did hunger and I did thirst. And then there came my husband's last illness and the time came when as I prayed for him, God said to me, the time is coming soon for him to go 
And when you hear the voice of God, you know it. And there does come a time. And when that time comes, it is good that a person should go. It is sad for those who are left behind. But when God said, this is the time the Spirit is prepared now to go, then that's it. He knew it. I knew it. Nevertheless, I had to keep up as much as I could uh, of the work you do. And pretend always and not let on that I knew. And then the time came and he did go. And what for that and a few other shocks and blows, the time came when my unconscious just said no more. And so I had to have quite a serious operation. It wouldn't have been so serious except that I put it off for a whole year and wouldn't tell a doctor or anybody about this lump I found because I thought I've got to finish my work first. I first got to get done with my assignments, and at that I didn't quite succeed. It was Vancouver and one other that I didn't succeed in getting done. So then that was followed by x-rays up to the limit of tolerance. And so for a long time after that, oh, more than a year after that, I was just sort of muddling through, as the English say. I didn't realize I had any particular need of anything. I recovered from the operation. I thought, well, I'm old now anyway, and I'm alone in the world, and so it turns to the myth. I'll just go ahead one day after another day, and I'll get through the best way I can. And it doesn't matter too much anyhow. So I was carrying on having schools of pastoral care and so forth and so on, and did not realize that Jesus had gotten so far away from me. Only it wasn't he. It was myself. I didn't realize. I didn't know that I had built around myself uh, sort of like a shell, trying so hard to keep my chin up and get the work done, I built a shell around myself so that neither Jesus nor anybody else could get through, and I didn't even know. How many good Christian people, earnest, striving Christian people, when they get older, they, this shell is built around them. Now, it's not their fault. We shouldn't go blaming them. And yet there must be a way to get through that shell for their comfort and for their joy and for the resurrection of the real self within them. Well, the Lord in his amazing goodness spoke to a young minister. It happened to be a young congregational minister, one of my many uh, spiritual sons, you might say. For ten years now, I've done this work, schools of pastoral care for ministers. So I have ministers all over the country who are my spiritual sons. And so this one got the vision of what was wrong with me and of what I could be. So he had the consummate nerve to come charging over to Whitensville, where I had a school of pastoral care, with the absolute determination that he was going to pray for me. But he's the age of my baby, my youngest son. But every morning we met after breakfast, the council rang dead for prayers, and he was among us, and he always insisted on laying hands on me and praying for me. One time I said to him rather impatiently, Jack, what are you praying for? I'm all right. He said, I'm praying for you to be one. I said, how can I be one? I've never been one. I've always been three people fighting themselves. He said, well, you're going to be one after this. <laughs> I still didn't know what vision he saw, but he saw it. And so he continued morning after morning and nothing happened. But he would not give up. And the very last morning of all, as the four of us were in prayer, and he had his hands on my head and was praying for me, that shell that was around me just broke. It just cracked. I don't know how to explain it. But it was just exactly as though there was a hard shell in which I was encased, and it was split as with lightning from heaven, and it fell off of me. And here I was, come to life again. And I felt waves of joy. Oh, unbelievable waves of joy, and I felt the presence of Jesus right there. I couldn't see him with the eyes, not at that time, but I could feel his love just flowing over me in great waves. And I held on to the hands of my two friends, and I said to Jack, who was praying, I said, what's happening to me? I feel as though I'm experiencing conversion. And he said, you are. Now, isn't that simply wonderful? Now, if I can experience conversion at the age of, well, I guess I won't tell you what age. <laughs> anyway, it was, an only, it was only a year and a half ago. 
And you didn't see me at my worst time, but I can assure you that I'm feeling better than I have for a good many years. Really resurrected, really come back to life, really and truly inside, come back to life. So if that need could be in me and in my life, don't be afraid to think that perhaps you have that need. You see, the trouble with some of us older Christian people, and some of us younger ones too, is that we think we've gotten where we're going. You see, we've accepted Christ, we're saved, we've arrived, this is it. Dear old brother Rufus used to say, if a man thinks he's gotten where he's going, he's not likely to get there. So let's give up the idea right now that we've gotten where we're going. There's still a long ways to go. Praise God, because how terrible it would be if there was nothing else. How utterly discouraging and pointless it would be if this was all that we could know of Jesus. If this was as near as he could come to us. If we could never, never, never be any nearer and feel him any closer and do his works any more powerfully, how sad that would be. Now, what was it that happened to me, really? You might call it experiencing conversion. And if there is another name, the process by which I had this renewal of life, the object for which this young man was really and truly praying, as I had taught him to do several years before, is what I call the healing of the memories, the healing of the past. You see, as I have told you, there was the accumulation of the grim memories of death and operations and x-rays and whatnot, but that's not all. And before that, there was the accumulation of all of the sad memories from childhood, which I will not go into. If you want to know what they were, you can read my newest book, The Second Mrs. Wu, which is autobiographical. I mean, the little girl was myself, and all that happened in it is true, except the one routine about Valerie. All the rest is absolutely, literally, word for word, true. So anyway, we all have certain memories. Very few people live to adult life without having certain old sorrows, certain buried insecurities, certain ancient resentments that date from early childhood. Now what do we do with these things? We stuff them down inside. We cram them down inside. We don't dare think about them. It's so sad. I remember Horton Kelsey said to me some years ago, why do you never speak of your Chinese childhood? A person wouldn't know you were even born and brought up in China. I said, well, it's so sad, I just would rather forget it. Now, it wasn't all sad. I put lots of humorous things in that book, but there was something. He said, no, that's not right. You should go back and relive it. I said, I don't have time for that, and believe you me, I don't. So he said, well, then, if you won't do that, write about it in a book. And at first I said, oh, that would be too boring. But in due course of time, I did, and just the second Mrs. Wu. It sort of grew itself into a novel afterwards. So we all have these things. Some of us have more. Some of us have not so much. But as we get older, every one of us, I do believe, is dragging certain little chains. Memories of old unhappinesses or old sins or old sorrows. We can get along with them. We can go ahead still dragging them. But how wonderful if we could be free. How wonderful if we could just drop them away. How wonderful. Now, we can. We can because Jesus Christ, the Son of God, lives not only in the present, but he also lives in the past. And he can come into you and he can move and operate not only in your present conscious mind, but he can move back through the years and he can operate in the hidden areas, even way down below the level of consciousness. So he can do, if we only open a door by faith and permit him to do it, so he can do. And at the end of this talk, I do not want to make the talk itself too long, because I want to pray with you, I want to take quite a time to pray with you for the opening of this door, and for him to enter in, and for him to go back to the past, and search out and find even the hidden areas, and heal those memories. Now, this is why he gave his life for us upon the cross, so that he could do so. This is why in the gods of Gethsemane, he entered into the deep mind of every person. 
We read this in Isaiah. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. He permitted them to come into him. He permitted all these griefs and sorrows of the whole world and the sins and the pain and the death of the whole world and every person who lived upon the earth to enter into him so that he could make the heavenly transfer, so that he could transform it all into joy and glory and beauty and light and send it back to us purified and clear. Now, if he did this, since he did this, why do we do not, not just automatically receive this great liberation from him? Because he has given us free will, and the choice is always ours. And according to these laws that he has made, and whether we understand it or whether we don't understand it, these things do not automatically happen to us. We say that we are crucified with Christ, or we have been crucified with Christ, and there's a great truth there, and the truth should be this, that the sinful part of our nature, the tendency to do wrong, or even the old sorrows that keep us burdened, have potentially been destroyed when our Lord himself bearing these things gave his life upon the cross. We say this, but it is not really true, not actually so, until with faith and understanding we open a door in the mind and find a way of asking him to come in. And sometimes we cannot do it all by ourselves. And when we cannot do it all by ourselves, then there are other ways. Some of them I will illustrate in just a moment in the stories that I will tell you. But another way is, when we meet together in a group like this, where there's two or three gathered together, Jesus said, there I am in the midst. And this is something I have found of recent years. In fact, since this that I told you tonight, it has been so increasingly that I do not have to have appointments to see people individually in order to pray for everyone for this liberation. But that if there is enough faith and enough Believe in the group, then, all together, somehow, we can be united in spirit, and we can open such a wide door that Jesus, the Son of God, will enter in and reach a deeper area than he's ever reached before. While I'm talking tonight, I would not be a bit surprised if, either while I'm talking or while I pray later on, I'm quite sure that some of you will find yourselves remembering things that you've not thought of for 10 years or 50 years. The last time I had a meeting like this, afterwards people told me, several said, oh, I felt Christ coming into me and going back through the years, and then I remembered something that happened when I was two years old, which I'd never remembered before. And I realized that was the beginning, that was the first old shock, the first old sorrow. And then I could feel that Jesus Christ was sinking in his arms, that little infant two years old that was myself, and was healing. And now it's gone and I'm free. Oh, this is the most tremendous therapy that can possibly be. Now for some of you it may not be quite so dramatic as that. Some of you may not sense or feel or know what he's doing underneath. It may be that several days later you will feel a difference in the likeness within yourself and you'll think, well, maybe it did work after all. So now, the only way I know to make it clear is to tell a few incidents to show the greatness of what he can do. Now, one time, for instance, one of the ministers who came to the School of Pastoral Care told me of a little trouble he had. He said it seems very silly and I don't know whether it's worthwhile even asking to pray for it. But he said, I have a fear of sharp instruments. I cannot even sit at my desk with a pencil pointed toward me. I have to point it the other way. Now, he said this. Not very important, I suppose, but it worries me. I can't understand it. Now, this was not a neurotic man. He was fine and poised and strong and able. And so, when people tell me something like that for which they would like me to pray, I ask them three questions. Tonight, I cannot ask all of you the three questions, but never mind. The Lord will come in anyway. There, there are other ways. So I said to him, well, this fear must be connected to something else. It cannot be really pencils that you fear. It's connected with another fear somewhere in your life. So now tell me, were you happy as a child? 
Now, perhaps, my dear friends, you can ask yourself these questions while I talk. But yes, he said, certainly I had a very happy childhood. And indeed, he had had a completely normal childhood, lovely home and so on. So I asked my second question, which in this case didn't work. I said, well, when did you begin to be unhappy or begin to be conscious of this fear? He said, I've never been unhappy. I've led just about as happy and normal a life as anyone could possibly imagine. And this silly old fear, I've always had it. I don't know why. So there was no good asking my third question, which is, why? And so I said, well, even if it is not within your conscious memories, it's got to be in there someplace. So if it's not in the conscious mind, it must be before you were, began to remember, when you were too little to remember. So I said, strange as it may seem, sometimes these troubles go back even to the hour of birth. So I said, has anyone ever told you anything of the circumstances of your birth? Whereupon this great big grown-up man burst into tears and began to sob like a baby. And that was the sign to me that this was it, that I'd struck the key. The Lord had given me the key to his problem. He said, why am I crying? I don't know why I'm crying. This is ridiculous. But he said, yes, I have been told. It was a very difficult prayer, but instruments were used. I said, okay, that's it then. Your fear of instruments began before you were born, while you were still in the body of the mother. So I said, all right. You'll ask Jesus Christ to come into you and walk back through the years to the time when you were born and even to the few moments before you were born and heal the soul of the fear of instruments. And so I prayed after that fashion, imagining the Lord walking back through all the memories and healing all of the silly little fears about pencils and things pointing to him. But that was not very important. I said, Lord, that's not really the thing. Heal them as you go by. Heal them as you walk through. But now walk through all the way to the beginning. And look upon the soul at the moment of birth and the moment before birth. And heal the soul or the psyche of this child as it was being born into the world. And I gave thanks, believing that he would do this. Because this kind of a prayer he always does. There is no exception. In praying for the healing of physical things, I tell people quite frankly, some things are very easy, I would say. I'm pretty sure they'll be healed. There are other things that are very serious. As I told you last night, I've seen very few healings of uh, so-called terminal cancer, though I have seen some. There are some things that I have not yet seen healed, physical things. But this that I'm telling you about tonight, the healing of the soul, the healing of the memories, the healing of the deep mind, this does not fail. I cannot think of a time when it has failed. Sometimes if people come to me, it takes more than once. Sometimes I may have a conversation with them four or five times before the key comes up. And I know that they know something they haven't told me yet, but I never ask. I never accuse them. I never say, what is it you're holding back? Oh, I wouldn't dream of saying that. Never. Never, because then I would frighten them. I just pray for whatever they tell me, even though I know it's not the key, and wait patiently until the key comes in. For so far as I can now recall, I do not know of a single time when it has failed. And my only regret is that I'm not a thousand people instead of one. And yet, I'm trying to be a thousand people. The Lord is working through me in two new ways, and one is the way of trying this kind of a prayer in a group as I shall tonight. I don't say it'll work perfectly for all of you, but I do believe there'll be a beginning of a release for all of you, and for some of you, it will work completely, perfectly. I don't know why, but so it will be. And then the other thing, the main thing that the Lord is teaching me is that I cannot possibly do this for every living person in the world. Or even for those in many, many countries, I'm going to New Zealand, Australia, Korea, England, Canada, as well as all over the U.S. And so therefore what he wants me to do is to teach and train others who can do it. And praise God, there are others, many of them, many of the ministers and also many of my living friends who have learned this. 
So now, such is the healing of the memories. We can go all the way back, all the way back to the very beginning. When I was in Holland two or three years ago, there was a Dutch minister who came to me. He was a very, very troubled man. He was in deep mental depression and great sorrow. His marriage was not happy. Uh, his wife claimed that he just couldn't make it happy in the usual ways, you know. He had worked with three or four psychiatrists, but they had not managed to get deep enough. He had lived at a retreat center, a healing center, for three months, and he'd gone to a healing service once a week, prayers for the laying on of hands. But that was not enough, because that did not reach the source of the trouble. And so I asked him my three questions, and I had to ask them through an interpreter, not knowing Dutch and he not knowing English, and that made it rather difficult. But nevertheless, the key did come, and it was a very common thing. It was a picture of a little boy who had no security. His father was a minister of a very rigid thought and very grim and very solemn, and he was terrified of his father and terrified of God and terrified of hellfire and everything, you know. His mother caught him in some little childish indiscretions, whether the little boys or little girls. I don't remember. It doesn't matter. But what did matter terribly was that she fussed and scolded and frightened him terribly about the un misunderstood emotions that a little child had. He was terrified of any emotion whatsoever. Didn't dare let him say, oh, he just must not feel any kind of feeling at all because it was so wicked and so awful. And so he grew up with this. And also a dreadful feeling of guilt about some other things that took place, which at the moment I forget. Some other slight involvements with either boys or girls, I don't really recall. It's not very important, but the important thing was the wound from the soul. The darkness, the depression, the fear, the guilt. And so as I said to the interpreter to tell him, I'm not going to pray for the man that I see now before me, the man that I see before me is a good and honest minister of the Lord, and I know it. He's living in righteousness and not in sin, and I know it. I'm going to pray for the little boy, the little lost, lonely boy, who felt rejected by both God and man. And so I prayed for the little boy. I had to pray in English. But that is a strange thing. He knew very little English, and yet he seemed to catch a great deal of what I said. Because the interpreter said to me afterwards, he asked a question of the interpreter, and she said to me, he said, how you know that? And I, I, I ascertained what it was, and I said, I know it because I felt it. I know the sorrow of the little boy because I felt the sorrow of the little boy inside of me. Because for the moment, don't you see, I was the little boy. I was not just myself. I became one with the little boy in spirit, as I want all of us tonight here in a mysterious, marvelous way to become one with each other. We don't have to work on it. As we listen, the Lord Jesus himself will come in and make us one. But in an even deeper way, I had made myself completely one with that man so that I knew that I was the little boy, and I felt them, and I even shed tears over them. And he was healed. He was totally, completely, absolutely healed and permanently healed. As far as I know, two or three years ago, and I forget just how long ago, three or four maybe, I've heard occasionally from other friends in Holland, from him, but of course in Dutch, I have to have it translated. He came the next week back to this retreat center where I was having a conference for lay people bringing his wife. Both of them were completely radiant, the joy just shining forth, the light from their eyes just, oh, lifting up your heart, just filling the place with glory. Now he's worked with at least three psychiatrists. He has spent at least three months at a healing center with laying on of hands every week. Why? Hadn't somebody done it? Why? Had this not happened before? Because... In spite of all the prayer and all the understanding of the psychiatrists, here was this one great, tremendous fact that they did not grasp. Not a one of them. Not one of them really knew 
that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is able to forgive sins. Now that's the other word for the healing of the memories, the forgiveness of sin. The little boy was beset and troubled by the sins of the world against him. Ah, yes, yeah. and yet. His own little acts and his own deep resentment, they were sins. I like to use the word the healing of the memories because it covers both. It covers both the healing of the griefs and the sorrows that Jesus bore for us and also the forgiveness of sin. And so I like to use that word. And yet really the two are the same thing because the sorrows are caused either by the sin of the individual or by the bitterness of the individual concerning the sins of others toward him. So really and truly. The two are the same thing. Now, I have said that these great and wise people did not believe this. All right? I don't apologize. I repeat my statement. I have had a number of psychiatrists tell me, for instance, that there is nothing that can be done about sexual deviations, that a homosexual cannot be healed. He must just learn to live with it. Now, that's the biggest piece of Tommy Rock that ever was. Why did Jesus come and give his life for us on the cross that people cannot be healed? Of course they can be healed. All that is needed for the total healing of this, as of any other sinful temptation, because the forgiveness of sins means not that God will say to St. Peter, Oh, here comes this person, he's really been very bad on earth, but he, uh, Jesus died for his sins, so uh, rub it out of the big book. Let him come in anyway. Now, that's not the forgiveness of sins. That would be the toleration of iniquity. And God does not tolerate iniquity. God is not easy going. God is not tolerant. Sometimes people who are afraid to tackle head on this question of the forgiveness of sins try this very shoddy method, saying, oh, God is very tolerant. Listen, friends, read the Bible. That's a lie. God is not tolerant. He doesn't have to tolerate imperfection because he can do better. He can correct it and make it perfect. And furthermore, he's a good workman. And a good workman does not tolerate shoddy workmanship. If you were a carpenter and you had an old broken down table and you were very tolerant, you might say, oh, well, this old table, well, it's got cracks in it and the legs are kind of falling off of it wobbly, but never mind, it'll be all right. <laughs> but if you were a good workman, you wouldn't put up with that, you wouldn't end that table. Well, God's a good workman. And he doesn't put up with it. He mends people. One time at a conference in the hall, I passed the minister, a very fine and lovely man, and all of a sudden he burst into roars of laughter. I said, what are you laughing about? I don't say anything funny. He said, well, all of a sudden I remembered what my trouble was when you first knew me. And it had been a long, long struggle with this matter of a temptation toward homosexuality. He was not overt, but he was deeply and bitterly troubled by the sentence. And he had forgotten all about it. He said, do you remember? I said, no. What was it? I forgot. Oh, I said, oh, yes, now I remember. I said, isn't that funny? He said, isn't that a scream? I think that is funny. I hadn't thought of it for months. And we stood there and we roared with laughter, the two of us. We shouted with holy joy. Now, that's the forgiveness of sins, my dear friends. That is the forgiveness of sins. Kierkegaard, I believe, said something like this. When the memory of past sins brings to a person's mind not sorrow for the sins, but joy in the salvation of the Lord, then that person rests in the forgiveness of sins. That's it. Is there anything in your past life that you don't like to think about, that it makes you feel uncomfortable and unhappy? Then you're not resting in the forgiveness of sin. I pray that before you leave this church tonight, you will rest in the forgiveness of sins. And that maybe a year later, you will think about that sticky old memory that used to afflict you. And when you think of it, you smile. Or maybe you'll laugh out loud. And you'll say to yourself, oh, I've forgotten that. I hadn't thought of that for ages. Oh, praise the Lord. He's taken it away. 
Now, why is it that even with us, people who try very hard to be good people, it is so difficult to get all of these old things out of the memories? Some of my own old sins of bitterness and resentment were not washed away until when was it two years ago, the incident I told you about, when this young fellow had the nerve to come and pray for me. Some others had been, but there were some lingering ones that had not been until then. Because I'd forgotten them, I was not aware of them. I didn't know they were hiding in there until then, you see. So why is it? It's because the choice is always ours. And because it is for us to open a door by an increased faith, by a pushing back of our old boundaries, by an increased imagination an increased knowledge of what Jesus Christ, the Son of God, can do. And that is why I tell you these little stories, because true stories, all of them, because that seems to me the best way of widening your own mind and increasing your imagination and helping you to grasp two things. And one is how good you really are. And the other one is, how you are going to rise into that goodness, and that will be you completely, and all the rest will fade away. I think maybe one reason why, when I talk with people you know, like the ones I mentioned to you, and one reason why the power does come through is because no matter what they tell me, now these that I've mentioned were very good people with little trifling difficulties, but I have talked to some people who were heavily burdened with brave and grievous sins. Oh, I tell you, I've heard enough to sink a ship, half a dozen ships. But you know, it does not in any way shock or trouble me, no matter what they say. Because I know that this one that they are telling me about is not the reality of them, you see. And sometimes I tell them that. Sometimes I say, yes, but this is not really you. This is only some dirt on the outside, some dust on the window pane. I can see the real one of you inside, and the real one of you is a child of God, made in the image and likeness of God, and the real one of you is holy, the real one of you is good. And that's true, I'm not making it up, that is true. No matter what temptations or tendencies this person may have inherited from their human parents or may have picked up from the world around them, the spirit of this person is born of God and comes of God and is born in holiness and true goodness. And the spiritual person is the everlasting reality. And I can see that everlasting reality shining through this envelope of flesh. I can see it. And so I know that the two will become one. And that this person will wash their robes and make them white in the blood of the Lamb. The robes, that's not the clothes that you wear that you can see with your eyes. That is the emanation of spiritual light that really and truly is around you, only you can't see it. Usually. And it becomes dirted and solid with the sins of this world. But the actual life from Jesus Christ our Lord, no longer in the form of a red fluid, though it is his life energy, or what one can call his life blood, that energy of our Lord can actually come and enter in and wash these robes and make them white in the blood of the Lamb. You remember the picture in the book of Revelation, the great company of those who've been through great tribulation. And how St. John said to the angel, who are these? And he said, these are they that have been through great tribulation, and they washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. But that process does not begin in the heavens. That process begins here on the earth. And so this can be. And this... I know, and there isn't any question about it. And of course, as I start to tell you incidents to show it, 
They come trooping into my mind more and more, more and more. But I think I shall tell one of this I told some of you before because it's perhaps the best, the most intrusive, more points that gathered into that. This was given me by a Freudian analyst, Dr. Stringham, who was one of the leaders of our school of pastoral care until he went to India as a missionary at a somewhat advanced stage. At least he had eight grandchildren when he was accepted as a missionary in India. And he said, I'm giving you this story so that you can use it. So here I go. And it is about a woman who was referred to him from a hospital because once a month she was taken with very severe pains and cramps all through the middle. And the doctors could not find any physical cause for this extreme agony. And so they rightly decided that it was psychosomatic, that it was an illness of the soul affecting the body. Many doctors know that now. Not every illness is that way, but some of them are, you see. And so they referred her to the psychiatrist. And after talking with her some, he discovered that three or four years before, she had had an extramarital affair, which fortunately had terminated, and her husband did not know about it, which was good. One does not confess to the husband, he would be hurt. One confesses to God, and often in the presence of another person, but never to a person who would be injured and hurt by knowing these things. That's no fair, you know. So he didn't know. Now, at the time of this affair, at the time immediately after it, after it had been broken off for some reason or other, she had the usual symptoms. And I've heard this a thousand times, and when people begin with this, I know just what they're going to say, because it's, it's, it's like a Victrola record going over and over, and it's the combination of migraine headaches and stiffness up and down the spine and butterflies in the stomach and lack of appetite and loss of sleep and maybe nightmares and tears, always tears, different ones. But many of the same, she had the very common ones, fears of crowds, fears of people, fears of steps, that type of thing, you see. Now that, I never pray for that, because that is never the real trouble. I don't mean it's imaginary, but I mean it is not the actual cause. It always has roots. And the roots are deep down, you see. So I always find out what the roots are. Now, at that time, she had counseled with a doctor because she trusted him. And he was a friend. And I'm glad that people have doctors whom they trust and who are friends. And yet, when I talk to the ministers in the school of pastoral care, I say to them, it makes me rather sad to think that there are many people who can trust their doctor and are not sure they can trust anyone else. Others, including the minister, might scold them, might be angry with them, might tell somebody else. Every one of us, my Christian friends, every one of us should be able to listen from their heart and never be shocked and never be angry and never scold and never tell every one of us, because as we belong to Jesus Christ, we are elected, every one of us, to be channels of his forgiveness to others. So anyway, she talked to her doctor, but the dear man did not really understand. He did the best he could, and he tried to comfort her in a way that's uh, very common nowadays. Unfortunately, it's become very common. Namely, he tried to convince her that she was not guilty. And he said to her, oh, my, I wouldn't worry about that, Father, you. Uh, many people nowadays have these affairs. We don't really think it's so wrong anymore with the, the new morality. I heard a lot about the new morality in England. It's about as new as Sodom and Gomorrah, as well as I can figure out. So anyhow, he said, I wouldn't worry about it if I were you, and God is very tolerant, and you're no worse than anybody else, and so on and so forth. So therefore, she decided, well, good, I don't have to worry about it anymore. And the conscious mind, she was convinced. And so the surface symptoms passed away. But what happened? Her spirit, which was everlasting, her spirit that was born of God, knew that this was not the highest nor best thing. And why? Because her spirit was good. Her spirit was born in the holiness of God. And no amount of convincing of any kind could persuade it to put up with anything else than the highest. And so therefore her own spirit said to her unconscious, this is wrong. Find some way of making her see that it's not the best thing. And so the body cooked up the first of his You see? 
It often happens, often happens, and we wonder what's wrong with it. And and it's, God is trying to tell us something. We won't listen to the conscious mind. The spirit tries to tell us. We quench the voice of the spirit. Then the unconscious tries to tell us through the body. It's always that. But it is, there sometimes yes. So we are wise if we will look within and see. You see. Now the doctor caused her to see this in his own wise way, and one day she said to him, You know, I changed my mind. I decided that affair was wrong after all. The doctor said, I'm very glad you come to that conclusion. She said, Now what shall I do? The doctor, having learned from me, I'm afraid, in the school of for care, said, Now go tell your minister and ask him to pray for your forgiveness, and then you will be well. She went to the minister, and she came back the next day, she said, oh, I'm worse than ever. He wouldn't do it. He didn't do it. I asked him to pray for my forgiveness, and he didn't do it. The doctor said, well, uh, what, 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 what did he do? She said, oh, he just talked about like the other doctor. He said, now, now, I wouldn't worry too much about that if I were you. Uh, God is very tolerant. We all make mistakes from time to time. Take it to the Lord in prayer, and I'm sure it'll be all right. And just don't fret about it. Don't worry about it. You know, the two silliest words in the language are these two. Don't worry. And about the silliest thing that you can do is to try to persuade a person they're not guilty when they are guilty. Because you cannot fool the spirit within. You can fool the conscious mind, but you cannot fool the spirit. And somehow, and some way, the spirit is going to Cook up trouble for him until they see. So the doctor said, Well, I'm very sorry. The minister just did not know the power that was in his hands. I heard this doctor now say to the ministers in the school of pastoral care, If only you knew the power in your hands and this one simple thing, the forgiveness of sin, you would not need to send any of your people to us psychiatrists. Heard him make that, make that remark. So he said to the lady, well, then, you and I will just have to do it. And so they knelt together on the office floor. And this good man thought, shall I lock my door? And then, bless his heart, he thought, no, I won't lock my door. Any Christian's got a right to pray for any other Christian. And so he said to the lady, now tell God what you did. Tell him you're very sorry and ask Jesus to forgive you, which she did very simply. And so he just accepted the promise of the Bible for her. He said, Lord, the Bible says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now this lady has confessed. And therefore, in her name, I accept these words of the Bible. And so I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you're coming into her now. I thank you that her sins are forgiven now. And she arose and she was well. And she never came back to see him for consultation again because she didn't need to. She came once with her husband to give thanks. The husband didn't know what had gone on. But she came once with him to express great thanks and gratitude. And she was completely healed from that time forth. So what I want to know is, why are we fooling around? What have we been doing for two years? I am we forgotten? That Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is able to forgive sins. Now, I know some of you are thinking, yes, but I've gone to God and asked him to forgive. Yes, I know. And, of course, for many little things, that's fine and that's enough. You know, us girls, if we get mad with a husband before breakfast one morning, and we say things we shouldn't, and then afterwards we think, oh, yeah, I shouldn't have said that. We just say, oh, Lord, I'm sorry I lost my temper. Please forgive me. And then he comes home and we cook him some special thing and kind of prance around, you know, and uh, so forth and so on. Maybe we say, I'm sorry. Maybe we just show that we're sorry and he knows it. And it's all right. That's taken care of. That's all right. So we do not have to go to somebody else always and for everything. That would be a bore. But there are some things that have happened in our lives, you see, that we, of which we are not relieved. As we say in the prayer book, the burden of him is intolerable. And we do ask him, we go to him, we take it to the Lord in prayer, and we say, please forgive me, and he does forgive us. He sends forth his forgiveness. 
But there's a little door between the conscious mind and the unconscious, and somehow by ourselves we cannot open it. And it's not our fault, really. Often we try and we try, and somehow or other we just can't open it. As people say to me, well, very briefly, one more story about an old lady who's had the usual symptoms and she was going to take shock treatments and I said, would you like to try a prayer first? I said, were you happy when you were a little girl? Oh, yes, very happy. When did you begin to be unhappy? When I was 15. Why? So she told me she'd had an affair when she was 15. And so I said, oh, you poor dear child, just imagine you carried this burden for 60 years. She was sent me back. When you could have been set free in 10 minutes, I said, don't you know that Jesus Christ forgives sin? She said, Sidney, I know that Jesus Christ forgave sins. I've been preaching it to the heathen for 50 years. She'd been a missionary, and she was not hypocritical. You see, you can preach a thing and teach a thing, and you're not a hypocrite. And yet you cannot accept it yourself, and that's not your fault. What you need is somebody to pray for you. Somebody to say for you the strong words of the faith, don't you see? And she said, I know Jesus has forgiven me, but I can't forgive myself. And that's what she was trying to say. So I endeavored to explain to her that Jesus Christ lives in all time, and he could come back through time and find this little girl. She didn't get it. She said, well, I just don't understand. So I tried another way. I said, now let's pretend. Let's pretend you lived 2,000 years ago. And suppose you had done this wrong thing and you'd seen Jesus coming down the street, and all of a sudden you run to him and fell down before him and shed tears and said, Oh, Lord, I'm so sorry I did this. Please forgive me. Now let's imagine that Jesus smiled upon you and took you by the hand and lifted you up and said, Daughter, go in peace. God has forgiven all your sins. Then don't you think you'd be all right? She spoke from her heart. And she said, Oh, yes. I said, Very well then. That's how we'll pray right now. We'll just imagine. And so I prayed this prayer for her, just imagining that picture. And then I gave thanks, knowing that Jesus Christ did find that little girl 15 years old, and gather in his arms and comfort her and say to her, daughter, go in peace. God has forgiven all your sins. And I gave thanks that he had done so, because of course he had done so. Well, she got up and she said, well, I don't feel any difference. And I said, that doesn't matter. I don't care how you feel. I'm not playing on your emotions. Whether you feel good, bad, or indifferent, I know that this has been done. Because it's what Jesus gave his life to do upon the cross. Therefore, it is the eternal will of Jesus. Therefore, it is the eternal will of God the Father. And so I say, regardless of how you feel, there is no power in heaven or earth good enough to prevent this prayer being answered. So go your way. You will soon find that your feeling will change. So in two months she wrote to me and she said, After three or four days I began to notice that I felt different. I still had the old fears, but they were not so sharp. They didn't hurt me so much. And now I've gotten better and better every day. And now I'm completely well. I don't have to go and have shock treatments. I sleep all night. My appetite is perfect. I don't have migraines or nightmares or anything. I'm not afraid of people or steps or crowds or anything. And she said, the most amazing thing is, I can recall the fact that I used to be afraid, but I can no longer remember what it feels like to be afraid. Now, isn't that marvelous? And yet, what is this? Is it something new or strange? No, this is Christianity. This is the good news. This is the gospel. That Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is able to forgive sin. This is what the church has taught from the beginning. Some of you have perhaps been thinking, what's the difference between this and the confession or the sacrament of penance? There is no difference. That is the church's stylized and very beautiful way of doing this very thing. And yet, well, shall I put it this way? The more the priest believes it, and the more the penitent believes it, the more perfectly it will work. And I don't care whether that's uh, 
what the church teaches them how that's still the truth. It may be valid. I'm not concerned whether it's valid or not. What I want to know is this person well. And so I will say, the more the priest believes it, and the more the penitent believes it, the more surely this person is well. And so that is what we are now going to pray for. And I have great hope in this prayer. It's nothing of my doing. I'm going to use a sort of a general symbolic fairy tale picture, like I did with this lady, only in a way that you can apply to yourself, every one of you. So now, just to be where you are, if you'll close your eyes, we will, we will finish with this meditation. Oh, Lord Jesus, we do give thanks for the wonder of thy love, for the amazing power of thy forgiveness, thy life actually given for us. And so we pray thee now, O Lord, as we are gathered here together, and as we have all been opening our minds and listening together and thinking together concerning this, I dare to believe that we have opened a wide channel. So I pray thee, O Lord Jesus, to come in now, overshadow us, O Lord, with thy Holy Spirit, and enter in on feet of quietness, but with power. As we open the doors of the deep mind to you, lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in, entering into the dark places and into the dark corners. As we lift up the gates, so I give thanks, O Lord Jesus, that you enter. And now I'm going to imagine a very simple, homely picture. And imagine you entering as a careful housekeeper might come into a house that had been locked up for a long time. So I say, oh Lord, and you will know what I mean. And each one of us will know what these words mean to us. I say, Lord Jesus, now come in. And open all the windows in this living room into which you enter. And lift up the shades and let in the sunlight of God's love. And take a clean cloth, O Lord, and wipe away all the dust and dirt upon the furniture. Furnish it with this that it may be clean and wash it that it may be whiter than snow. And take a big broom and sweep away all the dirt upon the floor. All the dirty old memories that have fallen upon the floor and lie there to our confusion. Sweep them away, O Lord, with the great from of your new life. And look at the pictures on the walls. If there are any ugly old pictures that have no relevance at all, just take them away. We need not remember them anymore. If there are pictures that should be there and should become beautiful, then make them beautiful, O Lord. Change them, freshen them, brighten them, and make them beautiful. And bring in fresh flowers. And fill this living room of our lives with sunlight and with air and with love. And then I'll imagine you, Lord Jesus, opening other doors and going back. Going back into other rooms, into the bedrooms, and there also, going back farther into our past, opening the windows and letting in the sunlight. Open the closet doors, O oh Lord, and see if there be any dirty rags of old memories that we have shut up in the closet and forgotten. And although we have forgotten them, it could be that they are making an ugly smell. Or in some way, putrefying in there. And so, Lord, open the doors of the closets. Take them away from us. Perhaps we need to remember. And perhaps we do not need to remember. Just take them away, O oh Lord. Just take them away. And I pray that you will go even into the nursery. 
even far back to the way back into the memories of early childhood and of infancy. And there, O oh Lord, make everything beautiful. Make everything clean. Always. All the way back, even to the hour of birth. And so I pray that you will heal the soul, even of the shock and pain of being born into this world. Now, this is the bold and daring prayer, O Lord, that I believe. That you are able to answer it. And so I give thanks that you are restoring the soul. As David said long ago, he restored my soul. And so I rejoice in the knowledge that this real one of us, the eternal being, is created in the image and likeness of God, and that as you wipe away all dirt and cleanse and make us white with your own life coming into us, that you are restoring the soul. You are bringing 